All right, everyone. Welcome back to the Golf and Filter Podcast. It's your buddy Adam, Nikki, Dan from Team GU. Hi, everybody. It's nice to see everyone on a nice Monday. Uh, we were just chatting a little bit before we got started here about fantasy football. Just a quick update. We're on week five now, is it? Keep me honest here. It's week five of the NFL season, and we had made a, a little pact. I won't say a bet, and we don't even agree on anything yet, but we had made a pact about uh, whoever finished last among the three of us we would have to do something but uh i think we've stretched so dan you're three and one mm -hmm. well think. i'm three and two now because today's monday and three i know and there's a game tonight but neither neither my or my opponent has a uh, uh player tonight so i'm i'm effectively okay. done for the week so three and two now yeah um yeah my uh, somehow i managed is, uh... to have three players going last night including the dallas defense which that's what did me in and only needing like seven points to win and couldn't muster um yeah. I, I probably would have won had I just not played a defense this week. Thanks, Dallas. <laughs> poor, poor Dallas. Uh, my sister decided to just beat me by uh, less than six points. So that's great. Shout out to you, Jess. And Nikki, Nikki, what's happening? It's not going well. It's not going well, <laughs> which is a pain because I really thought like my team was good. And honestly, most of my losses have just been like, like a bad, like bad luck of the matchup. Like mm. I've played decent. I've played well and my team has played well. It's just the team that I happen to be playing that week just goes off. And that, yeah. Yeah. Like I played against like the two, a Tyreek matchup or something like it, it just, you know, uh, yeah. I will say this though. It's I know I lost this week, but uh, I just have to throw this out because Nikki had a, made a comment after I drafted Jared Goff as my quarterback this year. I did not lose this week as a Jared Goff. He played very, very well yesterday. In fact, he's uh, kept me in, in many, many weeks so far, but uh, another good yeah. week from Jared Goff. <laughs> yeah, I literally made a joke about how, like, it ranked you as our, like, best-ranked team going into the season, yeah. and you had Jared Goff as your quarterback. And I was like, really? How did they rank you as number one? And then we played each other in week one, and you clobbered me. <laughs> with Jared Goff and Joe Burrow had like n n no points pretty much. And I was like, <laughs> I take back all of the things I said about Jared Goff. I'm really sorry. So yeah. Um, it's not, it's not going as well as I had hoped. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully, hopefully it's in the step, step in the right direction for you this week. I'm, I'm hanging around 500. Uh, this is GU. Kristen uh, goes down to uh mr dunnigan yeah our, our um, gu team photographer this week yeah this is how he plays fantasy football um he he either just like dominates the whole season or like he'll go in and make you think that like he's not a threat and then he'll come out of nowhere and he'll put up like the most amount of points all season like he'll drop like some 200 point game and um just he'll end up winning or making it into the playoffs on points alone or something just because of those couple games. And then because of how he just ends up in the playoffs, he pulls out some sort of lucky championship win and it's infuriating. <laughs> I, um, I have received multiple trade proposals from him and that man oh, really don't wants do it. I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm, not doing it. I'm, I'm telling not... you, <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> He wants Justin Jefferson something bad. And I'm like, look, man, look, no. And he, so I almost pulled the trigger uh, on one that he uh, proposed. And um, if Saquon Barkley wasn't like half dead, I may have did it. But <laughs> Jonathan, come on, let's, let's not go down this path. My, my friend, well, Justin Jefferson I know he's going to listen to this anyway, and he's so. going to be like, come on, like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why aren't you supporting me? But I, <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to fantasy football, I am in two different leagues with him and, and, and it goes the same every time. I know how he trades. I know mm. how it happens every time. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I no. would advise against it. <laughs> yep. Yep. He is. He is persistent and it's fun, but we're going to keep things going. We'll keep you listeners updated with our uh, our records here moving forward. Uh, Nikki, I can't help but notice you've got a. Uh, a Texas hat on with an N on. Mm. Um, you've had a wild few days. Yes. Um, the N is not for Nikki. Um, the, <laughs> the N is for uh, the Nelson. Um, 
which is at TPC, uh, the well, the Las Colinas um, Resort, mm-hmm. um, where they used to have the Byron Nelson um, before they moved it to uh, Craig Ranch a few years ago. Right. Um, yeah, I had gone out to um, Dallas for work and my flight was supposed to take off on Wednesday night and every other airline was canceling uh, around noon, realizing that storms were coming in around eight and my flight was supposed to take off at like eight 30. And um, I love Delta loyal to Delta and I applaud them for the confidence of being like, no, we got this. We're going to get you home. <laughs> um, but they did not get us home that evening. <laughs> they put us on the plane and we're like, we're going to look for a window that we can get out of here and then they were like, mm, some unexpected wind came up. And we're like, unexpected? What are you talking about? Everyone's been watching this radar for days. Um, so, yeah, we sat on the tarmac for three hours. And then before they finally returned us to gate. So, um, but yeah, so, I mean, they 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 gave they were wonderful, though. They gave us all vouchers. They gave us meal vouchers, um, even transportation vouchers to, for all of us to get back to our hotels or wherever we needed to be. Um, and my, when I called my company to help me kind of rebook my hotel, the only hotel that was available to me was the Las Colinas Resort and Spa. So (laughs) that is where I went. (laughs) I got a nice little trip to, um, to uh, a lovely golf course. Um, I unfortunately did not get to play, but I did, um, I didn't have enough time to play, but I did kind of mosey around enough to see a little bit of the course and um, moseyed into the pro shop um, to buy a few things and, uh, you know, at least got a flag to say I was there. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's nice. It's nice. Swanky. <laughs> you were sharing pictures. It looked nice. Definitely. Yeah. Looked nice. I mean, they, yeah. you know, they, you know, you got the 24 seven room service and it was, it was better than the La Quinta by the airport that, you know, I was going to be in. So, uh, so fun. It was funny too, because you were giving us updates along the way. And um, yeah, just the blob of radar that was coming like right over your plane. And the fact that you're just, you're just sitting on a plane and you're just waiting for this to happen. I've never been in a situation like that, knock on wood, where I've had to sit on the tarmac. I mean, Dan, have you ever experienced anything like that? Yeah, it was... Um... It was last year, I believe it was part of, ironically enough, because Nikki said that she had that happen to her on Delta. That was actually part of the reason why I now pretty much only fly Delta. Cause I think, uh, can't remember what airline it was. Not that I need to call them out anyway, but yeah, basically that happened to us <laughs> to a point where, um, we were sitting on the tarmac so long, but it wasn't any sort of real weather delay that we saw. Uh, there were basically just pa- planes backed up and it was so bad that we ran the, the plane ran out of fuel sitting on the tarmac in line had to go back to the gate refuel and get back in that line again uh and as a result we missed our connecting flight in nashville so then that ended up stranding us a night in nashville uh, i was not doing this for work so i didn't have a company that I could call and say hey can you put me up in a room we had to scramble to find rooms and i actually had to go to a gate agent and say i need you to take my bag off of this plane because i'm not I can't go anywhere else tonight because I have now missed my connecting flight. So I need you to get my bag off of this plane so I can have clothes for the night uh, here in Nashville so that I can then get up tomorrow and try again. Um, (laughs) That, that was the, that was the the worst it's ever been as far as like actually causing me to be stranded in a, in a city for the night. Um, Usually because obviously the, how the weather is in Florida, usually the only other times that's happened, I've either, known before going to the airport and then I'll just rebook and stay home or I'll get to my local airport. It'll be really, really bad. And then still, since I'm here, I can then turn back around and go home. But that was the first time that ever happened where I was not uh, in my home state and had to scramble on the fly. Yeah. I think the most stressful part was the fact that we were in a giant metal tube on an, (laughs) in an open field and it is pouring down rain. It is hailing and uh, the it was the wind was so bad on the ground that our our plane was shaking on the ground, and they're like, "We're just gonna wait it out a bit, and we're still gonna try to get you out of here." I was like, "I wish you wouldn't." <laughs> um, <laughs> and then we get an alert that there was a tornado warning um, oh, in the area. So, <laughs> which warning means one in sight, one is on the ground. Yeah. 
when Nikki oh, was updating us, when Nikki was updating us during all this, I, I fully expected her to end up being like that meme lady and yelling something. Else, so they let her off the plane, <laughs> and we were gonna see her read about her on the news. She was gonna be the next this this yeah. MF or a real uh, uh, <laughs> meme or whatever, because she's like, just get me off of this thing. I do not want to sit on this plane on this tarmac in a tube anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it all well, worked out. Oh no, it all worked out. You all worked out. You got a cool hat, uh, yep. and <laughs> you live to tell the story. Speaking of hats, I mean, I think uh, we just have to, <laughs> to to talk about this briefly because everyone else is talking about it. It's, I can't believe this is still a thing in the world of golf, but Hatgate coming out of the Ryder Cup. So I had two friends that uh, went to Rome for the Ryder Cup, and they were right. They were following Cantley's group, Patrick Cantley's group, and they did not know why everyone was doing the hat thing. Like they they had no idea. It hadn't reached them. Now these are two guys. Guys, if you listen, I'm sorry. They they are stupid when it comes to social media. So they don't really so follow. Do they, have, do they not they, pay for the international plan no, on their phones no, or something? They, like, how do you they just don't, not know? <laughs> they don't know. They're old. It's, you know, they don't get it. And um, so I kind of had to explain everything to them. And they certainly didn't know the backstory of whether or not these players should be paid for the Ryder Cup. And so uh, Dan and I talked at length about it uh, last week regarding Hatgate, as well as just some initial reaction, because it was just kind of coming out. The days that have followed now, we've learned a little bit more. Xander Shoffley's father has been talking about it, Stefan, uh, as well as all these other things. Look, Nikki, do we think that these players should be paid to play in the Ryder Cup? What's what's your reaction to all of this? Um. I personally don't because most of them are at least eight of them are in the top eight and automatically qualify to, to go and play anyway. And so if you're in the top eight, you're making money. Like it's not like you're um, having to fork over a, a crap ton of money to play every, all these tournaments, all this. So, I mean, if you're, you're in the top eight, you're making enough money. You probably have sponsorships. You probably have, you know, you, yeah. Um, and when we're talking about getting paid, it's not like they, nah, well, great. I don't quote me on this, but I, I mm. highly doubt they are having to cover the cost of their own transportation right. no. or their own lodging. So it's, I mean, it's, it's still a free in, yeah. like trip to wherever it is they are, you know, they're going, um, still free, you know, merch, it's still free hats, <laughs> it's still free, Everything. whatever, but yeah. they're just not getting an additional paycheck at the end. I do understand the sentiment of look at how much money these networks are making off of our names because mm -hmm. you walk into really any tournament and they have, you know, floor to ceiling posters of these players faces that they're using to draw people in. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, Oh, Hey, Jordan Spieth was here, you know, and it's sometimes it's like Jordan Spieth's not even playing in that tournament, but it's like Jordan Spieth did play here one time. So come on out to, to buy a ticket to this tournament. And so like, on that sentiment, I do understand their point in that, like, yeah, we should be getting paid for like our you you using our faces, but that is different to me than like get, get a royalty then get a royalty right. payment for hey if you want to use me for these mar for this marketing then give me a royalty off of like the ticket sales or off of the, the commercials or whatever, but not just a blanket, like, okay, here's your salary paycheck. Thank you so much for playing in the Ryder cup for your country. Right. Yeah. Dan, we've learned a lot more since the last time you and I talked, has your stance changed at all on it? No, I mean, Nikki, Nikki summed up a lot of the points that I you know, made last week. Like it's a free trip to Rome for them and their wives. Let's just start or significant others, but, you know, let's just start mm -hmm. there plain and simple, like free trip to Rome. All you got to do is just play a little golf while you're there. OK, um, you know, we we talked about, it too, it's 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 the same way it works for an MLB All-Star game, Pro Bowl, NBA All-Star game. Those guys aren't being paid 
specifically to play in those games, but they all have clauses in their contracts, whether it's with their team right. or with their with who, their endorsement deals. Like if they make it to an all-star game, they are going to get X amount of additional dollars for that appearance. I guarantee you, like you said, those top eight qualifiers, I guarantee you every single one of them had multiple clauses and multiple contracts with their, with the variety of their, whether it was their, their club sponsor, their hat sponsor, whoever, you know, Jordan speed, AT&T probably for Jordan speed too. It's like you make the Ryder cup team. If you make it as an automatic qualifier, you get this amount of money. If you make it as a spot or as, as a, as a captain's pick, you make this amount of money, you know? It, so these guys are getting paid. They're not get, the PGA of America. Isn't handing them a check. Well, actually they are even yeah. then. So they're handing them a $200,000 check to do with, to the charity of their choice. I do find it interesting that we now have learned that. And once again, he's allowed to do this. There's nothing saying that he can't do this, but Patrick can't lay donated it to his own foundation. Yeah. <laughs> um, he donated that to the Patrick can't lay foundation. So, uh, you know, I'm not accusing him of anything. We know a lot of these athletes do their own I charitable will. <laughs> foundations. Um, there's been plenty of stories written about how legitimate a lot of these foundations are that these athletes run. So you can take your own, you can you make your own conclusions off of that. But uh, yeah, I did find it interesting that we learned that that do- charitable donation went to his own uh, foundation. So uh, no. yeah, listen, you, you know, it's just. It, you and, mentioned and, the, and we, the wives and, get covered, like get their trip covered too. The, the interesting thing is that, Patrick Cantley got married the day after the Ryder Cup. Like, mm-hmm. not like that the week after, the weekend after, like on a Monday after the Ryder <laughs> Cup. And so, so he get, basically used to get yeah, married on a Monday. Of America to get a free trip out to Rome for his wedding. He didn't have to pay for his own travel to his own wedding because he basically yeah. used the PJ of America to get them to cover his travel expenses for his wedding. And not, and not just his travel, his wife's travel yeah. and all of his friends travel because he knew that a handful of those people who would probably be playing on the Ryder cup would be guests at his wedding. Right. So, I mean, I don't know. I think, um, and, and, and to, to know how far in advance you have to plan a wedding, mm-hmm. they're, they're banking on the fact on, on him being on the team, whether he was top eight or not, they're banking on him being on that team. And like, right. I, I want to know what would have happened had he not been in that top eight would he have been a captain's pick still? And if he wasn't a captain's pick, then what do you do? Do you still have your wedding the Monday after the Ryder Cup in Rome? Just because? Just because? Like, uh, Does the registry change at all in that service? <laughs> I don't know. The, the, the public wedding registry that's been out there. Man, that couple wants a lot of dishes. That's all I got to say. <laughs> There's a lot of platters. There's a the lot. The other of... thing I'll say too, Adam, and and you and I have talked about this extensively on the side, and and I know you've played some devil ad, devil's advocate in the conversation, and I'll still stand by my statement, and I understand that it's not as simple as just saying what I'm going to say, but it also kind of is. Um, if you're a prof- uh, either, on either side, I mean, clearly this doesn't seem to be an issue with the Europeans, so we'll just stick to the Americans. If you're an American professional golfer and you are not okay with not being played, and you are not okay with not being paid to play in the Ryder Cup, then do not play. In, like, just, just don't play. Nobody is holding a gun, even as an automatic qualifier. Nobody is holding a gun to your head and saying, you have to go to Rome, Italy now. Like, and I, yes, I understand. And, and, and I know that you did, you, when we talk about this, you're like, yeah, but it's really bad. Look for the golfer to say like, I don't want to represent my country. Okay. And like everything else in this world, they will get their blowback for a couple days. Something else will happen in the news cycle and we will completely forget about it in like 48 to 72 hours. Like, let's be real. Like, it'll be a story for that first day or two after he's like, I don't want to go. And then that's it. Another thing you could also do is like at the, at the start of each cycle. So like the Ryder Cup just ended last week. So now the, the new news cycle, the new cycle technically is going to start, you know, for two more years. Send out a questionnaire. Hey, if you are in a position to be picked two years from now, do you want to go? Yes or no? You the, the the results don't have to be made public, but then if you say no, you you never even get put on the points list. You just you're it, it's you're just never there. And then you I need to, to know who says no. <laughs> well, I need to know who says no. 
But you know, you're opinion can also I, change yeah. in two years too. So that's, that's right. That's a that's long. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but also or just, okay. Just don't so, go then. Like it's not like, especially when you consider about the and, and Adam, you know, I talk about like the amount of millions of dollars Keegan Bradley probably would have paid Patrick Cantlay for his spot. <laughs> like. Just yeah. don't go. Just don't go then. Just, you know what? Thanks, guys. You know, I thought about it. So, yeah, I'm hurt. I, I'm hurt. I'm not going. You know, I, I tweaked something like there's a lot of different ways to go with that, too. And I feel like and this gets into another point, too, where, you know, Patrick Cantlay, had he decided to not go. He loses leverage. I think him going and saying, hey, I'm here. I qualified to be here. Uh, by the way, why don't you pay me? You know, so it's almost like he wants to not saying that I agree with this, but he it's almost like he's putting himself in a position to be like, look, if you want the best chance to win, I qualify to be on this team. I should be here. And this is the word that I hate more than anything. I deserve this. Um, I could see where he would take the stance of leverage with the PGA of America. Now, the other thing that that I'm concerned with. And I don't know why. I don't know why, guys, that I care about what Patrick Cantley has to say. But he straight up lied to Steve Sands after his match. He straight up lied about, oh, no, no, all that's wrong. All that's wrong. And then a couple days later, his best friend, Xander Shoffley's dad, comes out on the record. And he says, yeah, no, it was about the, the hat thing. That, that was about money. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. But... Okay. This, this, but, we've gotten to the point where it's just been ridiculous. Go ahead. Not to play devil's advocate, but mm -hmm. I, well, I don't know if Rory directly lied or if someone lied on behalf of Rory, but there was also some lying going on on whether or not conversations and apologies happened after that debacle, parking lot debacle, too. So, like, everybody's lying. Like, everybody is lying. Nobody's telling the truth. Like, I don't know. Another thing that bothered me about the situation yeah, is to for somebody to schedule a wedding and the day after the Ryder Cup gives me the vibe of like you don't you already don't have confidence that your team's going to win because <laughs> if you you're not going to be I don't know because you you just know that you're not going to be partying if you if you mm -hmm. if you win you're going to want to party all night long with that team. Right. And you know how they partied last time they won. You saw how the Europeans partied this year. And like, I cannot imagine you being like, yeah, uh, I'll, be, I'll be, I'll be good. Like I'll, I'll party with the guys and celebrate and then get married the next day. Like, mm. no, there's no way that that happens. So you're going into it being like, no, we're probably not gonna win so it won't really matter like i won't have to worry about being super hungover the next day that's a fair point uh yeah i don't understand because i mean as we also see a lot of times no matter who wins um some of the players on the losing side if it's in europe it's usually the american side they will go and they will party with the europeans you know we saw the photos of uh you know brooks and whoever else you know drinking out of the cup you know, Brooks, Brooks is just having a great old time in Rome. It seemed like, by the way, too, you know, he's given his new buddies, Max Homer, Ricky, old, old, old grandma, Ricky in that picture, uh, the, the smash t-shirt and they just had a great old time. And, um, I gotta tell you, uh, I, I'm starting to warm up a little bit more to Brooks. I kind of like this, this Brooks, this Brooks of that we're dealing with right now. He's, uh, he's. <laughs> He's a lot of fun to kind of watch and see what's going to come up next. And then he turns around and of course that they timed this perfectly. The, the reports that came out about what he not said like about those country club kids. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I just, this is, this is silliness. This is the entire thing is silliness. What was your take on that, Dan, about the country club stuff? <laughs> um, listen, Tell us what I, you I think. Don't... I, I don't know. I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to even know um, what his personal family dynamic was with him growing up. I know that he did grow up in my area. Um, I know the high school he went to. I know um, what it cost to go to that school. Um, I, I, he, he was very much not a country club kid, but um, I also am not sure if he was quite um, 
as, as I guess you could Pick say, them up from the bootstraps or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, it, it, you know, yeah. it, listen, $130 million is $130 million, even to country club kids too. Like, let's not, let's not act like it's, you know, $5 or somebody's throwing you and you don't have $5. Like, um, but at the same time, yeah, listen, it, his level of just, I do not care what you or anyone else, which it's also a little bit funny too, because he doesn't care, but then uh, making a statement like that would certainly imply that you do care. Cause if you're so worried about these country right. club kids, then maybe you care just a little bit more than you're trying to give off that you do or don't care. So, um, it was an interesting statement. Um, his mom basically coming and saying like, when did we cry? Like that was kind of funny too. I don't know if she did that in jest or if that was legitimate. Um, it's just, you know, listen, it, as if, as if things weren't already, uh, real housewivesy enough in professional men's professional golf right now. It that that just kind of added to the to the plot line, so to say. Nikki, uh, your guy JT responded in a pretty pretty good manner. Actually, said, you know what? This let's leave this stuff alone. Nobody really cares about this stuff. What's your uh, your take on any of this? I also think he said somebody needs to stop Shipnuck or a version of that, and um. Yeah, I have opinions about that too. Um, mainly just the fact that one, like, I don't know who orchestrated the like leaks of the comments. If it was like from the book, if it was like a P like a press release ordeal, or if it was like, um, I, I, I don't know. But the timing of it seems very, I got the vibe of like, maybe maybe Shipnuck was more team Europe because if you're mm -hmm. team USA like if you release those comments you know on one hand if they aren't accurate first of all that it's probably going to unite that team room a little bit more because clearly it did I mean just if you kind of just look through Instagram at the different posts of like of Sam Burns and JT and Jordan Spieth and Brooks right now, they're all commenting on each other's posts. They're all like mm -hmm. hyping each other up. They're all, and it's very, you know, team camaraderie, whatever. Um, right. But even after those comments came out, they're all defending each other and backing each other up. And if those comments had come out during the week of the Ryder Cup or even before the week of the Ryder Cup, I think they would have kind of, um, you know, linked arms a little bit in defense of like, um, no, I don't have any problem with these country club kids. Where did you get that from? And they would have been like, right. what do you mean country club kids? What, what are you talking about? Where did you get that quote? Um, in addition to there's other things that came out of that book that are very clearly, um, uh, off the record things, right. which we already knew that from the Phil situation that happened um but there's very clearly things that people have found out that they were mentioned in the book that they had no idea because they weren't sat down and interviewed they weren't talked to they were just overheard at a tournament somewhere and because right and a comment was overheard it got thrown in the book and so it's it, it begs the question of journalistic integrity a little bit mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. And it doesn't become, oh, because you're writing a book, um, everything you hear and everything you see gets to be included. Um, or are you like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Those are the one. Yeah. Just the thoughts. one other thing I'll say too is I, I, and I don't want to, I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm, I'm not understanding of what these people do. Like, I, I don't want people to hear what I said and say, oh, well, you're accusing Brooks of, you know not being what his financial situation is irrelevant. Like I've never once questioned what somebody wants to do financially to support their family. Like if, if, as long as you are okay with the decision you're making, then it's not for me to, to say, don't do it. But it goes back to everything we talked about in the very, very beginning when live first happened, where all these guys were coming out and saying, Oh, well, I'm going to live because I want to spend more time with my family and I'm going to live because it's a shorter, mm. uh, I don't have to play as many tournaments. No, dude, just say, Hey, look, they gave me $130 million and say, come here. Like not a single person on planet earth is going to say, Oh, well, how could you take it? It's $130 million. Everyone's going to take $130 million to do their job less for less amount of time than they currently have to do it. Like nobody is questioning that. It's just, it, they continue to try to come up with these weird excuses for why they did it. It's just like, 
you don't need to give us some excuse. Just say, hey, I don't care. You don't need to say, oh, well, I was never a country club kid or, oh, I want to spend more time with my family. Nah, man, just come out and say they gave me an obscene amount of money to do my job less frequently than I do it now. I'm going to do that. I'm going to take more money to do my job less. Like, why do we need to keep coming up with these excuses? Like, you don't need to anymore. And the PGA Tour loyalists are now are still chomping at the bit to get while the getting's good. It feels like, you know, I don't know if we have this conversation about money and whether or not they should get paid to play in the Ryder Cup and all that. If Lid live doesn't happen, I don't know. That's I could be wrong about that because in '99 they did the same thing. Marco Mira, Tiger Woods, David Duvall, Phil Mickelson. They wanted to get paid, and in fact, they didn't ask. They walked into the room and they said, "This is what's going to happen." And uh, thankfully. Cooler heads prevailed and they got that figured out. And then fast forward to now, this is what we're talking about. So I imagine that this is going to cover a conversation that's going to continue. Um, I think uh, both sides of that coin, no matter where you land, whether or not these players should get paid or not, is kind of a moot point to the greater landscape. And Dan, we touched on this uh, last time, whether or not the Ryder Cup is impacted in any way. I would agree with what we said last week. Um, with what you said last week, rather, uh, the president's cup. I think that is in the crosshairs of maybe not being around much longer, especially with the lack of, uh, competitiveness. Let's just call it what it is, uh, regarding that whole thing. So time will tell, um, any parting thoughts from either of you on the uh, whole hat gate thing. Go ahead, Dan. I do find it interesting too, that you brought up what we talked about last week about how, you know, how I said that I, I think that we'll see a live, Current a current live player today be a, a Ryder Cup captain in two years, and I specifically uh, mentioned Sergio. You know, it, on that, and then I don't know if you guys saw that Sergio liked. Uh, I think it was Greg Norman Jr. Mm-hmm. who tweeted out something yeah. to that effect of Sergio will be that next captain or should be that next captain, and then Sergio liked it. So, yeah, I, I think that's just further proof that we are, while we all on this side of the ropes, so to say, are still very up in arms about the separation of the two it would appear that the actual movers and shakers and the guys actually hitting the golf balls don't seem to care as much anymore. And I think I, I, I even now, even more so think that uh, two years from now, we will see live guys actively participating in yeah. the Ryder cup, whether it's playing captains, vice captains, you know, in, in any of those capacities. Mm-hmm. Yep. Absolutely. I think totally the agree. photo of the, the, all of them with the smash t-shirts also hugely alluded to that. Yeah, absolutely. I think the uh, the lines are blurred, if not completely gone now. Um, this is this is professional golf. This is the landscape right now. And it's just going to be interesting to see how all these pieces fit together. Um, I think the the pipe dream of live going away or whatever, I think that is what it is. I think it's a it's a pipe dream at this point. Uh, Before we transition to another point that we wanted to bring up, just remind everyone that we are powered by Bridgestone Golf. They are the title sponsor of the podcast. Uh, Thanks to those folks over there uh, for all the work that they do for us. Now, uh, before we let uh, before we go, we do have a PGA Tour stop that's coming up this week. It's the Shriners Open, Children's Open. The uh, main topic, one of the main topics, headlines, Lexi Thompson is agreed to play on a sponsor's exemption. Uh, she has done this uh, many times before. Uh, Michelle Wee is another name in the past, LPGA Tour great, uh, that has played in men's events. Uh, and there have been a, a handful of others as well. So clearly, this is someone, uh, and we were talking before we got going here, um, Lexi isn't in the top 10, I don't think. But that's one angle that we could take with this whole thing. But I wanted to get your both, both of your thoughts on the inclusion of Lexi Thompson in this, her decision, sponsor's uh, decision. Nikki, let's start with you. Um, obviously, this is a a uh, interesting spin on a tournament that doesn't get a lot of fanfare during the fall. Uh, but what's your what's your initial reaction on this? Well, I mentioned this during the um, when I was complaining about the lack of coverage of the Solheim Cup and how there was a lack of, um, I guess, camaraderie and um, collaboration on the marketing between the two teams and how like they were both there. They're both in Europe. Like they could have done a whole lot. Um, and especially since one of their big talking points on the men's team was how they wanted to bring recognizable names, um, to 
to Rome for that reason. Um, and I made the comment about how, well, Lexi is probably one of the most recognizable names in, in women's golf right now. Um, active, active players, um, yep. in golf right now. And she may not be in the top 10, but that she is the most recognizable name. Like there's, mm -hmm. I don't think you can really argue that. And so it's, I'm going to get, I'm going to get flagged for saying this because people are going to completely take it the wrong way, but it's, it's similar to when Tiger shows up to a tournament, people who do not follow men's golf at all still know the name Tiger Woods. Right. And so if you do no, not right. follow the LPGA like at all, you probably still know Lexi's name. And mm -hmm. so I don't think it matters. Even when Tiger was playing like booty, it, you, you still knew his name. You still wanted to watch him. You still like turned on the TV because he was in the tournament. Ratings still went up. And so I don't think it matters that Lexi's not in the top 10 right now. I don't think it matters that she's not like number one in the world, whatever for, for this tournament. Like it, we're not, it's not like we're talking about, you know, she got a sponsor's exemption for the masters. It's not like we're talking about a sponsor's exemption for like even the players, you know, it's mm -hmm. it. And like you said, this tournament doesn't typically get a lot of attention anyway. And I think they're trying to change that because it's a tournament for a good cause. Like why right. not bring some more eyeballs if we can. Um, and everyone's been complaining for a long time about, growing the game, getting more men and women's, like bringing more from women's golf over. Like, I don't see this as a bad thing at all. And I, if they want to, I've seen people calling it a gimmick. Fine. Sure. Yeah, it is a gimmick, but like, it's a gimmick that's, I mean, working to both advantages. I mean, it's, it's going to help women's golf, but it's also going to help I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, mm -hmm. I don't see really anything wrong with it. Yeah. Fair enough. Dan, I know that a lot of the back and forth and Nikki, you just alluded to it a little bit. Who, who is benefiting the most? I know both are probably benefiting, but damn, in your, uh, damn, Dan, in your opinion, um, is this Lexi helping out the tournament more or is the tournament helping elevate a name that perhaps a lot of these casual golf fans aren't watching on a weekend usually? So really quick before I mention that, I, I looked it up because I actually was curious. Uh, in the official Rolex rankings, which is the women's OWGR, uh, she is 25th right now. So just so she's she's um, fair enough. Um, at, at its most basic level, I think that it's just a win for golf in general, because at the end of the day, when you when you break it down to its core, it is a fall event smack dab in the middle of football season. Not a lot of people are watching it. Uh, so even if you get a couple extra eyeballs on the event, it's a win from that standpoint. Um, just to play, I mean, at the end of the day, at its core, I don't have a problem with it, but uh, just to kind of play devil's advocate to an extent, um, the, the, the two, I guess you could say issues that I could see with it is one, you mentioned it, Michelle, we on a good Sorens has done it too. When in, in previous situations, when this has happened, um, the woman who went and played in that PGA tour event was just at the time. So above and beyond dominating the women's game that it was like, yeah, in, in the same way that when Alabama didn't lose for four years and everyone's like, Oh, could they beat the Jaguars? It's like you, you, hmm. you start talking about it. Cause it's like, you have the best on one and you want to see what they can do against the best in another. And so it's like, okay. And, and you know, and, and yeah, even when they did it, even as, as good as they were, I think a lot of people said, oh, this is a sideshow or it's a publicity stunt, whatever, besides that point. And, and this is not, trust me, this is not a knock on Lexi Thompson. She is still one of the best golfers in the world, but she's not number one right now. I don't think anyone would argue that she is playing her, per I think she would probably tell you as well. She is not personally playing her best golf. And so the timing is a little bit, I don't want to say strange, but the timing it, it is a little bit, um, it doesn't quite compare in the exact same way as it did other times we've seen this happen. Mm. That being said, like I said, I'm fine with it. It's going to get more people to watch. The only other problem that I don't necessarily have, but I think that there will be people out there that will have this problem. And 
once again, it's, it's, it's not, there's no real answer to it. And, and it's a sponsor's exemption. Sponsors get those for a reason. They pay a lot of money for those. They are allowed to use those as they see fit. Um, however, in this new, in, in uh, this new version of the PGA tour that we have, where we're back to a calendar year season and they have shrunk the number of guys that make the, the playoffs. And as a result of that, that means they've shrunk the number of people, guys that can qualify for these elevated events. And a lot of these guys now have to go play the fall in order to either reclaim their status or get better status. You do have to wonder, okay, is there a, 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 a guy that's maybe on the fringes of, of the corn Ferry tour to the PGA tour that maybe could have done, use that sponsor's exemption to actually get a tour card or get a better hmm. spot in the, in the rankings. And once again, the sponsors pay a lot of money to sponsor these events. They are allowed to do with these sponsors invites what they please. It's it, it, it. Let me put it this way. It has nothing to do with Lexi, Lexi Thompson. We've had the same discussion when it's come to Steph Curry playing at a corn Ferry tour event or right. Tony Romo playing at a PGA tour event or any, anybody that's not a, a men, a men's professional golfer playing in men's professional golf event. There have been conversations about, well, great, it's going to get more eyeballs, but is it doing a disservice to the game? I'm not saying that is the case. I think that there will be people that will argue that. But like I said, at the end of the day, at its core, it is a fall event in the middle of football season. Not a lot of people would be watching. There will be people, more people now that may not have watched this weekend that will tune in. Well, even at just Thursday and Friday, you know, assuming that she doesn't mm -hmm. make the cut, just to see what she does when she's out there. So, uh, a lot of good points there from both of you. And I would say my biggest thing with with uh, exemptions like this is is I don't know if it puts Lexi in this case in a situation to succeed because mm -hmm. it's almost a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. Dan, you just kind of mentioned it. If for some reason Lexi doesn't make the cut and they're going to play the, the the from the yardage of 7,100 yards just for the uh, sake of context of what I'm about to say. If she doesn't make the cut, then there's going to be this uh, mentality that, okay, Saturday, college football, Sunday, you've got NFL, probably not going to watch anyway. So what does that, but how does that benefit Lexi? In my mind, I'm not sure. What I will say is this on our TikTok channel uh, for Golf Unfiltered at Golf Unfiltered, I can't tell you how many people go in there and give this opinion that, oh, women can't play from the same distance as men. And they go into this whole thing about, well, because uh, men are clearly going to be better at golf in this way, in a professional context, because they can hit the ball farther. Um, and for those who aren't watching on YouTube, I'm rolling my eyes at that comment. But at the, at the whole thing here is, look, Lexi, being the individual woman who gets to go and do this, they're not, they're not uh, uh, opening the doors to, you know, like five LPGA players. Get them all out there. Let's see how this group of extremely talented golfers can go and play on this course. Let's just nip this thing in the bud right now. Put them at 7,200 yards. Sure, they're going to hit hybrid into a green where perhaps somebody else is going to hit a five iron, whatever, or a seven iron. Let's just put them on a stage so that we can see exactly how good these players are because they are. They are damn good. And the whole thing of it is, if you put all of that onto one person, uh, Point well taken, Nikki, to your point, extremely well known, name, notoriety, all that thing. I just don't know if this is a lopsided beneficiary type thing for the tournament itself, who's going to get maybe a handful of new viewers because of this, whereas Lexi may get a handful of new fans, certainly, but what message is actually trying to be shared here? And that's something that I've always really struggled with because it's like, look, bring more eyes to the LPGA tour. If that's what we want to do, I mean, I, just as an idea, I don't know if this would even work or if anyone would be extremely uh, against it, but let's put a, a, a top, you know, a corn fairy tour male player on a LPGA tour event. Why the hell not? What's going to happen? You're going to get somebody in that tournament. Now it, we've never done that. We've never seen something like that. Well, who needs most eyeballs right now? Is it the LPGA? Or is it the PGA Tour? Is it Lexi Thompson? Or is it all the other extremely talented players on the LPGA Tour that don't have the same opportunity that Lexi is taking right now? And even in my explanation here, it probably sounds like I'm going back and forth. And it is a circular thing. It's like, okay, well, who's going to balance this thing out? Who's going to benefit the most? 
And it's something that I'm just not quite sure we figured out yet with these special uh, sponsor exemptions. So I'll get off my sub, here, soapbox now. Here's the yeah, other thing too. She, you know, she had that flub chip shot during the Solheim Cup and got asked about it afterwards. And she yep. didn't like she the does. line of questioning. She didn't want to answer it. She thought it was a stupid question. And that was during the Solheim Cup, which, yes, is the biggest event on the LPGA schedule, but still, and I, I don't know what the actual ratings were, but that they, they were still largely com, uh, pales in comparison from a viewership and eyeballs perspective to even just, you know, most standard PGA Tour events. Okay, great. What happens if on Thursday she flubs a chip shot like that at, at the PGA Tour? She will get asked about it. Mm -hmm. everyone will ask her about it and she's going to be expected to answer it. And if she has that, one of those types of, I don't want to answer this. This is a stupid question. Things again. Now, all of a sudden it's going to be a real a much spot. bigger deal. And it's going to be mm -hmm. shown to a much wider audience because everyone on golf, well, everyone on golf Twitter saw the soul. I'm cut, but then it, all of a sudden it's going to make more of the mainstream sports feeds, you know, whereas the Solheim cup might've just stayed, to the confines of quote unquote golf Twitter. So, well, um, and to not be that fair, I'm saying it's, it's also... going to happen, but she better be prepared to answer questions that she, even if she thinks they're stupid, if she's going to do this, she's going to need to be able to answer, be prepared to answer every, any question that comes to her and do it in a way that's not going to cause negative reactions to her too. It's okay, a pretty, see, uh, I have yeah. a, I have a, an, an issue with that. And that, that situation kind of reminds me of the, um, remember a couple of years ago at, um, I want to say it was Wimbledon, may have been the U.S. Open, when um, Serena Williams got um, scolded for being mm -hmm. um, vocal or angry yep. um, because she she asked about a point that um, that rightfully she was fine to ask about. Um, she didn't throw her racket. She didn't scream. She didn't yell. She just said why, why was that out? Like, what, mm -hmm. where, like, can I get a, can I, you know, get a review on that? And, um, they called her vocal and angry and told her like, she doesn't need to play this game if she's going to question everything. And, um, comparatively, there are several, several men's players who have won multiple times who scream, yell, throw rackets. And, um, they're never they're never called out for for that. And so if we are going to say that Lexi needs to step up and, you know, oh, well, she needs to be able to handle this. She needs to be able to answer questions. Then we need to be able to say the same thing about men's players, too, who aren't yeah, answering totally. questions in the press conference, who are oh, ignoring, 100%. you know, these questions who are saying, oh, I don't want to deal with that. It's not fair to make Lexi live up to that standard and not to make the men live up to that standard too. That's not fair. Oh, yeah, agree. I, I think the men should be doing it too. That's I wasn't saying like, Oh, it's she, I'm just saying that. Right. Yeah. The last no, I know thing you're not. I'm just that. Saying that. <laughs> oh yeah. No, listen, listen, if, 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 if that had happened in the Ryder cup and it wasn't the Solheim cup and Xander, Xander shop with Pat, Patrick Hanley. And then we're like, that's a stupid question. I'm not answering it. I absolutely would have come here and said, you can't, you no, you can't say, you know, you, it's not a stupid question. It's a warranted question. Everybody saw it happen. I'm just saying like, unfortunately that was the last time we saw her. She was getting testy in the, in a media room. And now every eyeball outside of golf is going to be on her. And so she's just got to know that, that, that she's going to have even more eyeballs on her now yeah. this week than, than she normally would. But no, hundred percent. Everyone should be expected to answer any question, whether you're a guy, girl, whatever you, you know, anything, any, anything. Yeah. hundred percent. And with the, um, it, it's a kind of put a bow on this, the, the point about how players respond to questions being asked by reporters. Yes. Let me, let's face it. Reporters can be a real pain in the ass. Sometimes we've seen it multiple times. And some of these reporters, we, we talk about it amongst ourselves. You know, what kind of question was that? Who would ask something like that? How are we trying to expect these um, reporters to do their job when these players just simply won't do their job? And it's part of their job is to answer the question that's being asked of them. And uh, can't lay completely just lying and not to, you know, go too far off topic here, but can't lay lying to Steve Sands face and therefore all of our faces when saying that, no, it had nothing to do with that. And then we give Lexi a hard time 
fresh off of a Solheim Cup loss, essentially, you know, to not answer that question. And Nikki, your point's really well taken. You know, we have to afford certain things. And and I'm just I'm hoping that the extremely non-forgiving golf viewership demographic, and we all know what I'm refer- referring to, uh, doesn't look at the inclusion of Lexi Thompson this week in a way that it wasn't intended. And I'll just leave it at that. Um, kudos to her for going through it. I'm sure her and her PR team and everyone, agent, everybody met to talk through this. And I'm sure it's going to be an extremely great event. I'm assuming that there's going to be no issues. Um, I'm sure she's super excited to get out there too. I mean, obviously yeah, she wouldn't absolutely. have to do it if she wasn't wanting to do it. So I'm sure in her mind, she's got, this is probably once in a lifetime opportunity for her, um, you know, as bad as that may sound, but you know, to to get a chance to do this and to represent the LPGA tour the same way that we saw Michelle, Wee and Anik Sorenstam and so many before her do it, um, regardless of the outcome and whether she makes the cut or not, I think that obviously, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a big win for the equality within the game for sure. Absolutely. Regardless of anything else. I bet she knows what a gherkin is. They included her in the Nickelodeon slime cup. So just saying. I forgot about that. We need more Nickelodeon things. We need to bring that back. That needs to come back. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've uh we've we've caused enough fires today. Uh that's Nikki Dunnigan. That's Dan Hauser. Uh we had a lot of things that we needed to cover. Um Coming up in golf, uh, we will continue to have uh, episodes like this, folks, by the way. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube, be sure to subscribe and follow us all over the place at Golf Unfiltered. We would appreciate that. Um, We're going to have some uh, interviews that come up, too, with some new products. Uh, I know a few people have reached out, and this is a really hot time in the world of golf in terms of new stuff that's going to be coming out. So we're going to be bringing them on as well to talk through some of that new stuff. So stay tuned for that. Nikki, nice speaking with you as always. Glad you're back home in one piece from your uh, Texas adventure. Dan, it's always nice to see you as well. Go Braves.